Yeah, so I work for Nottinghamshire Health NHS Trust. Um, oh, I'll use the clicker. Um, so they're quite good. The I don't know how deliberate this is, but the talks fit quite well because obviously Colin was saying get rid of all widgets, and then we had a kind of Python type thing. And I'm going to say jam as much as possible into your inter inter application. <laughs> so um, there's, there's an opinion for everyone, I think, today. Um, so basically today I'm going to talk about just uh, a history. I think the history of Shine is quite interesting. I've been using it for quite a long time, and I think it's quite interesting to see the way that's involved. And I'll just talk about the stuff that Shiny does and doesn't do well and how we can combine Shiny with other tools um, to make things better, which is what I'm doing. So the clicker, I think, I wonder if I'll move this. It won't work there like that. Oh, it's not on. Beautiful. Um, right, so Shiny. So this is just my personal recollection. So <clears throat> you may disagree with this. That's fine. Um, so I've been using it for quite a long I think I started using it in 2012. Um, and back in the day, it was, uh, I've just realised I didn't set a timer. Back in the day, it was really more, ex more suitable for exploring your own data. It was just, it was more of a toy, really. People weren't using it in production, um, and, you know, rightly so. Um, but then over time, obviously, we've done um, more and more things with it, um, and there's been more documentation, there's more functions out, and we've had um, things like um, modules and all that kind of thing. Um, but in the early days, it was lots of, I mean, I'm completely self-taught. I imagine probably lots of you are as well in terms of programming. Um, we were writing applications with not very good documentation, very little guidance, and with predictable consequences, they were terrible. Um, and I think it's still true today, I think, um, uh, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So people, I work in the NHS, Excel is very dominant in the NHS, I'm sure it is in lots of industries. Um, people who only know Excel end up doing everything in Excel. They write um, discrete event simulation models in Excel, which is not a very good idea. Um, but I think we suffer from the same problem ourselves as data scientists, that if you only know Shiny, you write everything in Shiny. I've had lots of conversations with people who say to me, oh, can I do this in Shiny? Can I do And I'm like, well, yes, you can do that in Shiny, but don't. Um, so, and a big thing that people have talked about from time to time that I like to remind people of, whoops, can I just say the laptop's got Ubuntu on it, which made me very excited, um, is data science is a team sport. Uh, we've been told this for a long time with this sort of ideal unicorn who can like, write super hardcore ML Python code and write accessible Java. They don't exist. Um, so it's team sport, and I think the world needs shiny developers. I'm guessing probably some of you probably are shiny developers. I've just recruited um, someone of, with that job title. I think, as far as I know, it's the first shiny developer anywhere, full-time shiny developer anywhere in the NHS. Um, no one's told me that it's not. Um, and I think that's really good. I think that Shiny is so big and complicated and difficult now that it, it, it's, a, it's a job in itself. Um, so I think that's really good. Um, so what do Shiny developers do? What are the skills of a Shiny developer? Um, so they are, they are many and various, and they probably won't have all of these skills. Um, obviously, are in Shiny. I mean, there's an awful lot just in that. Um, but there'd be things like, uh, like doing things like DevOps and getting things in deployment, use it looking like data with like, things like pins and targets. Um, the language of the web, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, visualizations, accessibility, um, doing things like with, with modularization, working with different code bases, all this kind of thing. Um, and also just using uh, like internal data packages or um, you know, packages from across the thing for different types of analysis, all this kind of thing. I'm bringing it all together. So Shiny Developer, for me, would be sort of the nexus of all these people doing all these clever things, and they're pulling it all together and making it into a Kieran hole, and that's the project I'm going to describe, basically, is we've got... Well, we don't have enough clever people, actually, because the NHS is broke, but um, we have some clever people <laughs> doing some clever things, and the shiny developers pulling it all together. It's funny, I've been saying the NHS is broke for about 15 years, but it's becoming more and more true. So, anyway. Um, right, so what do I do? So, a big part of my job in the NHS is we collect a lot of patient experience data. So, basically, when you go to the hospital, <coughs> they send you a form that says, how was it for you, basically. Um, and there's a like ticky box with it says very good or good, you know, very good or poor or whatever. Um, but there's also like a text box. And people can write anything they like in it. So they might write, like, I couldn't get parked or the doctor was rude. Or sometimes they write amazing things like, you saved my life, this is amazing, you're also kind and wonderful, that kind of thing. Um, and there's masses of this that I can't, I should have looked at, uh, there must be at least a million of these comments in the system. I don't know how many there are, but a colossal amount because everyone is mandated to do it, the whole NHS. So it's a huge amount of data. Um, but most of the organisations collecting it don't really have the staff to actually read. They can read bits of it occasionally, and someone might go, oh, we've seen this about your ward. And, like, people are looking at it, but they're not kind of looking at it in a systematic way. Um, 
So my idea, uh, which is not a particularly original one, uh, was to build an algorithm to, to read that patient feedback and, and say what it was about. And it does that uh, in two senses. The first thing it does is it says what it's about. So is it about the staff? Is it about the facilities? Is it about the treatment? That kind of thing. And the other thing is it says how critical is it? Criticality, which is a terrible word. We've been trying to replace it for 18 months now. It basically means, does the post say that it was terrible, or does it say it was good, or does it say meh? Um, right, so... Um, this is quite hard, basically. I think that the point of this talk is I'm saying that we are doing something that's deliberately hard. We are looking at a very complex data set, and we are trying to present it to people uh, in a very accessible way. There's a potentially very, very large amount of it, and we want to make it interesting and accessible, and we want to make it good. And if we don't do that, they won't look at it, and they won't make patient care better. Um, so this is a very... Uh, you know, this is a big, important thing that we're doing. And I'm trying to do it for everybody. So it's all open source, of course it is. Um, and I'm trying to make sure that we solve this problem once, and then everybody, everybody's got it solved. And all those millions of points of data can all have this one algorithm run over them. Um, so, basically, text data is... All text data is complicated, because it's text, obviously. We all know that. Um, but I do think that this is particularly unique text data, because it's about human experiences. So this isn't like, when you go on like, uh, what's that thing called, medium.com, they often have like things like classifying Reddit posts or like movie reviews or something. And I consider that to be sort of relatively simple from a text mining point of view, because this post is about football, this post is about politics. This, you know, it's the, 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 the dividing lines are fairly clear. But with something like this, um, it's a lot more difficult, because people talk about lots of things that kind of overlap with each other, um, and it's, there's, there's quite a complex um, thing. And it's about the way that they feel. That's the thing. I don't really want to... I mean, I couldn't, I don't think, write an algorithm that tells you how people feel. I don't think it's possible. Um, but I wouldn't anyway. Um, because what I want people to do, really, is to read the patient feedback. That's what I want. So it's kind of why I started doing this, to be honest. I think... I was a bit worried that someone else, like my sort of evil twin on the other side of the planet, would have the idea of kind of reducing it all down to a metric. And the managers would just go through, oh, this is 52% good, or this is 68%. You know, and I was trying to do the opposite of that, trying to make, trying to bring out the, the, the richness of the text data. <clears throat> right, yes. So basically, in order to do that, I want the tool to help people to, to, to understand the data, to help them to read it, basically. And the way that I want to do that is basically to find the stuff that's interesting. So the other thing that's interesting about patient experience data is that, to be honest, most of it is not very interesting um, in the sense that about probably, I don't know, maybe three quarters of it just says it was great. And I don't know how much, you know, how often any of you go to the doctor. I personally go to the doctor a lot. Um, it's usually pretty great. It's quite rare that something bad happens. Um, which is really good, and it's really good that we collect that data, but we don't really need to look at it because it just kind of says the same thing. So we can kind of get to put that in a box and say, yes, here it is. All these people are happy. Let's put them over there, and then let's, let's dig through the rest of it. Um, and so that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to basically show people the interesting things, and I'm also trying to show the people the things that are interesting to them. That's the other challenge. So, um, for example... Uh, you might be someone who uh, runs the, the sort of the, the site. So you might be in charge of kind of, I don't know what these people do, you know, like the electricity and the car parking and the water and, the, you know, the heating. And, you know, you, you run the buildings. And people will say stuff about that. They will say, you know, war, this ward is freezing. Or, or there's all this work going on outside. And, you know, they will say stuff about that. But, and you want to see that, and I want to show it to you. But then other people who run a ward, like a nurse... People will be saying, oh, the medication takes ages, or oh, the toast is always a bit weird, and, you know, all this kind of thing. Um, and I want to show that to you. Um, my ultimate aim, which I have to say I have not achieved, so don't get too excited for the end of the talk, I haven't done this. Um, but what I want to do is um, produce a recommendation for patient feedback, basically. And it would be, for those of you who are not familiar with recommendations, it's a kind of data science type concept, but just for, if you haven't heard of it, it's a sort of Netflix idea of people who like this, like this. So people who watch kind of Godzilla will watch King Kong, and people who read posts about car parks will read posts about lighting. And people who read posts about medication being late will read posts about the marmalade took ages to come or whatever it is. Um, and in order to do that, I need to build a system that is 
very intelligent on in the in the back of the system. It does feel like a very long setup. This doesn't it? It's going somewhere. Honestly, it's going to resolve you with this talk. I swear <laughs> to you. I want the back end of the algorithm to be to be thinking deeply about what everything's about, and I want the front end to be very interactive and say, "Do you want this? Do you want this? Do you want this?" And I want it to receive a lot of information as well. I want the LDU to say, "No, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in this. This sentence is good. That thing you've classified wrong." I want there to be a very good conversation between a highly intelligent algorithm and a highly interested user. That's basically the thing. And as I say, I've not achieved it, but I'm talking about the technologies with which we are trying to crack that particular nut. Whew, right, OK, let's move on to something a bit more prosaic now. <clears throat> OK, so we've already done this for a year, and we've built a Python algorithm that does the job, that works. Um, so that's cool. And we built a shiny dashboard, which is, I have to say is not very good. The reason why it's not very good is because we didn't have a shiny developer on it, which kind of beautifully illustrates my point. It was me doing it when I could, when I wasn't supposed to be doing other things, and it's a bit rubbish. Um, so this year, we are really focused on getting the shiny experience right. So we've got a full-time shiny developer, and we're going to sit in the chair and say, right, for a whole year, we want you to make this better. And we're going to give you all this technology to put into it. And that's kind of the model. Um, so... Uh, yeah, so we've already got a lot of, I hope, intelligence about the, the, the stuff, and we want to kind of leverage that more through the magic of Shiny and the other things I'm going to talk about. So, I think I've said all this. So this is a challenge, basically. Um, and I think it's fair to say, you may disagree, you can disagree with me the questions if you like, we're in the break. Aaron Shiny is not particularly good at either of those. It's not particularly good at doing really, really fast ML in the back, in my opinion. And it's not particularly good at being highly interactive and doing all these kind of crazy cool things um, either on the front end. Um, it's sort of um, it's sort of in the middle, isn't it, really? I think, I think of Shiny as being a bit of an all-rounder, really. Um, there's probably a really good football analogy, but unfortunately I don't, don't know anything about football, so just make up your own. Um, so two languages that do are JavaScript and Python. Um, so JavaScript, obviously, as we know, does all sorts of kind of clever things, and we were listening to Colin say, put them all in the bin this morning, which just makes a funny um, premise to my talk. Um, it does lots of in interactive, entertaining things um, on, the, on the front end, and Python uh, obviously will do lots of things in the back end, and we've already written loads of Python code. Um, I think that I'm really happy that we've made the right choice with Python, because I recruited an R programmer to do this job, and he did it with R for about six weeks. And he came to me and he said, this is really just not working. So I just learned Python. Then he did learn Python, and then he did it. And that took him a year. Um, so you know, I feel like that sort of illustrates the point, really. Um, right, so yes. So uh, what have we got on the Python side? So the thing about Python, and we, someone was mentioning this morning as well, um, is they always say, whenever you pick a language, don't just look at the language, look at kind of the ecosystem, like what's, up or what's out there. And I became interested in Python actually even before this person uh, came to me and said, hey, let's use Python, um, because it's got so much stuff for text in it. I think it is, um, as far as I know, you, again, I may be wrong, I may be out of date, um, it's got more up-to-date stuff to do with text in it. Um, so uh, <clears throat> we're using pretty standard tools like Scikit-Learn, which, um, I, to be honest, I don't know a lot about machine learning, but I gather it's very, uh, what's the word, comprehensive as far as machine learning goes. And things like GenSim, which is a kind of all-purpose text uh, classification, not classification, like text tool. You know, it can do lots of things with text. Uh, text Blob, which kind of does a cool, uh, has lots of nice prepackaged features. Spacey, which is incredibly difficult to install, but once you've actually got it working, does, again, lots of really cool things. Uh, Vader, which is a very simple out-of-the-box uh, sentiment classification. Um, so we've got all these nice things in Python that we want to use, and Python itself, as a language and as an ML tool, is fast and multi-core out of the box. So that was, the, that was kind of how we fell into this, really, as we, we, we were running the Python code. And it was, it was just beating the R code kind of, you know, uh, eight times over kind of thing. <coughs> so, right. <coughs> now, you should never do demo, should you? So I've done, I've done a demo. Um, and I should say before I open it that it's very silly. So please don't judge me for it. It's just supposed to... It's a kind of tribute to something that I love, really. Um, but it's not my job to make this, and please don't think that this is what the NHS is doing because we're not we're doing lots of sensible things with surgery and you're looking at people who are But this is to illustrate the principles of what I'm talking about. I hope it's going to work. Um, so this is... <laughs> I can't believe I'm showing this at a conference. Anyway, um, so this application, I'm going to come back to it. I just wanted to show you what it looks like, basically. So you'll probably guess straight away that this is the JavaScript bit. So I don't know why you would want animated hearts on your thing. That's probably something sensible you can do with that and to get your users engaged, whatever that might be. 
Um, and uh, also, there's some Python running on as well. So let me just show you the Python as well. Um, so, oh, hang on. No, no, the Python's not showing. Never mind. There's supposed to be, I do apologize. I don't know what's happened. I must have redeployed it and messed it up. There's supposed to be a histogram over to the far right with sentiment from text blob. Um, it, the code is all on GitHub, so that's the more important, really, is the code. But anyway, just imagine that's there. Um, and I even did this, and I don't know if this is going to work, but I can't help but press it just to see what finds out. You've got to press a button that says press me, and let's find out. Yeah, there it goes. OK, all right, I'll quickly get rid of it. Um, so, as I say, that is stupid, but I built it to kind of illustrate the principles, and I'm going to give it the, the shiny bottom for starting in a few weeks. So I'm going to say, so this is a really silly version of what you want to do, but it will illustrate the principles. Anyway. So how do you do that? How do you do that thing that I just failed to show you because I redeployed it and broke it? Basically, it's with Reticulate, as you probably guessed. Um, Reticulate, for those of you who are not familiar, which maybe not nobody, is a package in R that allows you to run Python code. It's incre I mean, it's ridiculous. Like, it's embarrassingly simple. There are some things, aren't there, in life that are just, you don't want to tell your boss how easy they are because you're kind of embarrassed, and this is one of them. So all you do is you just have some Python code here, and it's such simple Python that even I can read it. Um, and you just define a function like that, and then you just source that somewhere in your Shiny application, and that's it. That, that's it. And then off you go. And look, here it is. Here's the function. So, I mean, I, you could, literally couldn't be easier than that. Um, and that's what it does. So, um, as I say, this is a silly ex uh, example, but there are loads and loads and loads of really, really clever things with like text vectors and like part of speech tagging and you know, all this stuff. Um, that it really that it opens the box for. So I absolutely love one of the things I love about this whole ecosystem where working is that you can just jump off at any point and just go and get something else and bring it in. That's fantastic. Um, <clears throat> so you can do that. That will probably do for us, but you can do other things. Um, so you can just import in Python packages and just use them as if there are packages, um, which is also again embarrassingly simple. You can just run a Python script and it will just do something, and that object will be available. So if you want to go and hit a big database and just crunch loads and loads and loads of data, just run the script, and that, that object will just also, it will exist in your R session. You can just fetch it, so you can do that. These are linked. So all the slides, it's all online. I'll tweet it later or something. Um, so if you're interested in any of this stuff, then uh, do just have a click around. Um, and also, you, number three is you can build an R wrapper to your Python code and just call that directly. And actually, that's what, we, that's what we've started to do in this project um, is... So we, at first we were calling Python, and then we were like, well, we can't be, bo you know, that's just, it's too much mental effort to context switch. So let's just take the Python, put it in an R-shaped box, and then just call it from Python. So that's kind of the ultimate, is calling Python objects inside R-shaped boxes from R. I mean, that really, 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 really couldn't be easier. So that's that. So that's what we're going to do. Sort of relatively early days, but we've got some cool things planned, and it, you know, it's a proof of concept, and it works, and we're very excited. Um, so the next bit is JavaScript. Um, so just a very quick, um, I'm sure this is probably known to 99% or 100% of you, um, but it's worth saying that Shiny, basically whenever we interact with a Shiny application, we're hitting the server. So this, we're making the server do something. Um, and that can be problematic depending on what you're doing. Now, most of you will know there are clever things you can do. So you can use reactive functions, you can cache things, you can do throttling and debouncing. You can relieve the pressure on the server. You can make your Shiny application less insistently banging on the door of the server every five seconds saying, I need some more data. You can do that, um, and that works very well. However, um, the, the, the user's computer is probably just sitting there just doing nothing the whole time. It's actually all the work's being done on our computer, and they're just doing, um, the computer's doing nothing. Now, we could run crypto mining on it, and if the NHS gets really more broke, I might possibly uh, do that, but that is for another talk at another conference. Um, so what we can do instead is we can run JavaScript in the browser, and that makes we're like, well, you do something. If you want this data, you do something with it. Um, and so there's lots of JavaScript packages for it. Obviously, Colin kind of talked about some of this stuff uh, earlier. So obviously, we have the DT package, just all this nice kind of stuff like this. Uh, there's the shiny JS pack package, which kind of bundles loads of JavaScript for you. Um, and that's really nice, um, but you can just do what you like. Um, you can have any... Um, uh, you can write your own JavaScript, you can nick some off the internet, um, you can uh, use packages, all this kind of thing. So um, in that demo, the music that I went to, 
Um, that's from a package, I think, called howler.js, just to illustrate the point of how easy it is. Um, you can write your own JavaScript. So those hearts that, that flow up, I didn't write that. I stole it off the internet. Um, but I mean, all code is ultimately stolen off the internet, isn't it, really? Um, but it's, you just put it in a folder, and, and off it goes. Um, and I think you need a bit of CSS to make it work as well. Um, I won't show it again, because I've only got five minutes left. Um, Golem, I have to mention Golem. I, love, I can't believe I'm talking about Golem with Colin in the room, but I'm just going to go with it. I absolutely love Golem. It's made me a better person, even never mind about a shiny programmer. It makes it very easy. Just run this, add JS file, add CSS file, and they just go, boom, appear in your RStudio session, plonk your code in, and off you go. Simple. Couldn't be easier, really. None of this stuff could be easier, really. Um, anything you need, howler.js code, any module, any of that kind of stuff, just stick it all in there. It all goes in the same place. <coughs> um, and any like graphics or the, the, the song that I played, uh, all of that stuff, it all just goes in there. Um, and it's just referred to as www slash the file name. Um, and that's it. Right. So just to remind you why I'm doing all this ridiculous stuff um, with Jane Eyre. Um, so I think the power of Java, and I don't want, as I say, I think there's a, I think, I hope I've made it clear why I think it's a bad idea to get Shiny to do this. We can actually get the user to have lots of interesting moment-to-moment -moment interactions with the text. So for example, we can mark up the text, we can mark negative sentences, we can mark words on a theme, like say, mark up sentences or words that are to do with doctors or staff or parking or, and this can all happen on the fly, so they can be shown something and say, well, I want to go over here, or I'm going to go to the next page, I want to go to the next theme. I want you to highlight only half as much of the stuff that you've highlighted so far because you're highlighting too much. I want you to highlight, you know, we can have a, we can, I'm trying to give the user the tools basically to almost have a conversation with the model to say, well, I'm interested in this thing that you're showing me, but this is I'm not so interested in. And kind of, and writing shiny code to do that and just in R, you, you're back and forth with the server and it's going to keep going and going and going and going and going and going. Um, and also just off in JavaScript, it's just, it's not, like it looks nice, it's like it's attractive, it's nice to use. Um, and you know that can, that can go some way to, to draw people in. Because the thing is, my users aren't that, everyone's got different users, and I was Colin was saying, it's really important you think about users. My users are really interested in this. That's, that's my benefit, is they want to know. They're not sitting there like bored, like, oh, I've got to put my data in it. Like, they really want to know what's going on in their walk. So if I give them a, a tool like that, they will, you know, they will use it. They're not like turned off and bored and like, oh, I don't care. Um, so I can push the boat, and, and that's what I'm doing. Um, and also the final thing to say is, and I don't know when we're going to get to this, but I want to be thinking about a system that will do it, is I want the user to tell, talk back to us. So I want the user to say, no, that's not classified correctly. That bit is kind of classified correctly, but not really. That word isn't about that thing that you think it is. It's about that thing that you think it is, that kind of thing. Um, and again, I think JavaScript is the only sensible way of having that kind of low-level um, interaction flowing through a shiny application, I think. Someone's probably sitting in the audience thinking, no, you're wrong, I could write that in Shiny, but in which case you're cleverer than me, so which is fine. Um, so that's why we're doing it. Um, so I just had seen the two-minute sign, so I think I'm, I'm timed just about right. Um, so to summarize what I've been talking about, um, I would say let Shiny do what Shiny does best, insert football analogy here. Um, don't be afraid to bring in other languages. In fact, Tom in the break was just saying to me, what about compiler languages, Chris? Well, there you go. So that's another talk again. Um, uh, yes, indeed. So I've only talked about these, but there are probably lots of other, other languages even that will do other clever things. Um, so just try and think about uh, the best tool for the, for the job. Um, and just to, to give my reflection on kind of where we are with Shiny, really, I do think... Uh, I'm kind of used to talking to an NHS audience, to be honest, and I know you're not an NHS audience. I'm trying to, it's hard for me to kind of break out of that pattern, really, because um, I think you're, I'm used to talking to people that are a bit in the Stone Age. Um, but my message to the NHS and to everybody, really, is that being a Shiny developer is a complex thing. It has a lot of different kind of modalities and, you know, skills, and we should, um, we should, make, we should make this a job. We should make this a, a, like a, 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 an art form in itself, and give people, you know, the, the skills and the abilities and the kind of the work that, that, to, to do justice to, to kind of um, the level of, of what they're doing. And I think, hopefully, what we're doing here is a good example of that kind of work. That's it. <laughs>